Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Do this. The motion picture you're about to see was filmed by many teams of cameramen in more than a hundred locations around the globe. Scientists representing the world's foremost research centers took part in the examination of the evidence. The facts that will be presented are true. This may be the most startling film you'll ever see. Episode 82. I'm Tom Merritt. Hey, I'm Brian Brushwood, and that was Peter Graves introducing the mysterious monsters from 1976. Did you, did you watch any of those UFO monster hunting in search of? They're, like, pseudoscience was huge back in the oh, late 70s. Oh, man, I thought he had done that just for us. Uh, I mean, what I meant to say is that was custom recorded just for frame rate 26 years ago, and only now are we allowed to show it. Thank you, Peter Graves. I did watch uh, In Search of religiously. Uh, and which means I watched it on Sundays. Um, <laughs> you watched it during church. Ran yeah, I watched out and watched church up. <laughs> you know, that would have been awesome. I wish I had had smartphones back then when I was a kid, you know? It's kind of sneak. <laughs> More watchable. It's like it's in the middle of the sermon. No way! Bigfoot's totally real. <laughs> <laughs> Leonard Nimoy said so. Uh, well... <laughs> Uh, we should remind live viewers, this won't matter so much to you folks watching On Demand, uh, but Frame Rate will be coming out on Mondays for you On Demand people because we're going to be recording the show starting next week at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Central Time, uh, right here on live.twit.tv. So it's the all new Twit schedule. Everything's moving around. Things are crazy. Uh, but you'll get Frame Rate a day earlier in your podcatcher. And by the way, keep in mind that you probably hear us. We mention stuff that the chat room says all the time. You can be one of our staff writers. There's a reason that in the intro to this show, it says, and the chat room. You can be on the show. Come join us. It's more electric that way. It is. We sing the body electric of the chat room. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into the first big story. This just in, the big story. Uh, Bright Cove is a company that helps people figure out how to do video on the internet, for lack of a more precise and accurate definition. Uh, they're sort of known as a back-end player, but Bright Cove CEO Jeremy Allaire is getting a lot of attention today over his pushing of a new Bright Cove service that allows you to make apps to take advantage of AirPlay. And, and very cleverly, he's promoting it as, hey, look at this, the Apple TV is already here. All you got to do is make an app that takes advantage of it to the best advantage. And, of course, he thinks the best advantage is using the Bright Cove new app platform. But I think he's got a point, nonetheless. Uh, he's showing off a lot of apps in a video that allow you to start playing a, a movie from, from a movie service. Like, they've got something called Vito de uh, demonstrated. You, you press AirPlay to send the movie to your TV, and then you have a whole wealth of second screen features to take advantage of. Not the least of which is remote control. You can pause and rewind and all that sort of thing. But if you want facts about the movie, et cetera, et cetera, those are all right there at your fingertips. So it was really weird watching this demo because I was so excited. It never got better than that moment when he was watching uh, the movie on the iPad and then sent it to the, to the big screen instead. And every moment after that, I was excited and ready to see some kind of killer feature. And instead, he opened up a social tab and says, for example, if you want to tweet about the movie you're watching, you yeah. can tweet about it. I'm like, well, I can already do that. Or it's like, or if you want to take a quiz about the movie you're watching, I'm like, well, I can already do that. And it's like, I, I actually ended up this demonstration more disappointed than I was before it began. Because I think it's great that they're betting on it. I think it's great that the infrastructure is there, but it's clear that everybody's thinking about the mechanics and nobody's thinking about 
the killer app. Nobody's thinking about the content. Nobody's thinking about a compelling reason for people to care about this feature set. And I think that's the difference between how Apple thinks of things and how all of us stupid people think of things. And, uh, and I don't think that this is what Apple TV is going to look like. I think Apple TV will figure out the human element that makes people care about it. Like, look, he's playing this quiz here, which would be great if you had a bunch of iPads and they were all playing home quiz games. But you could already do that with you don't know Jack on a Xbox. Well, OK, uh, a few things in response. First of all, every person in the audience who happens to be working on second screen material is flipping you off right now for saying nobody's thinking about. They're all racking their brains thinking about. They're right. dying nobody's, trying to figure out. nailed it. Yeah, nobody's nailed it, I think, it is better. Uh, this is much better than you don't know Jack on an Xbox, though, because if you have an Apple, again, there's a lot of ifs here at the beginning, right? If you have an Apple TV and you have an iPad, it's much easier to use and play and interact with. Uh, because and and you're more wide open with what you can do with it, I think. But well, yes, and so, so I, I I think what he's saying about Apple TV is here already is sort of true, and but I I don't think this is what the Apple Television is going to look like. We had Peter Rojas on uh, Tech News Today last week. He said he thinks what they're trying to do is get the cable companies on board to have an Apple interfaced set top box, so you get all of the AirPlay, all of the Apple TV stuff and your current video service all in one thing. And they just need one company to sign on. And they, they and Pete said, I bet it's Dish. Dish would be the, the most likely uh, candidate for that. And that's what Apple TV would be. Well, and it could, and it could be. And keep in mind, I, 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 when I see this, I think the, the structural capability is phenomenal. I think, uh, yes, th this is fantastic scaffolding for something amazing to happen on, but I haven't seen what that amazing thing is. And I do believe it's going to be in that, that marketplace of innovation that, uh, that a thousand people are going to try a bunch of ridiculous ideas and somebody's going to discover that perfect use for, for this multi-screen technology. But, I mean, have you seen a single thing that, that makes you feel like an integrated second screen is now a must-watch or even a supremely novel experience that, that would make you want to bother to load it up? Yeah, it's the web. <laughs> it's exactly, the Safari right? browser. That is the <laughs> seriously. Like I, I get why everybody's like racking their brains. Like, okay, we got to figure out the second screen because everybody's using the second screen. And I do. I have a tablet and I use Safari and I look up things on IMDb or Wikipedia while I'm watching that have to do with what I'm watching. And yes, occasionally I will open the Twitter app, especially if it's a live event, so like Oscars sure. sort of thing. Uh, but I don't need a service for that. And so what I haven't run into is me sitting there going, ah, I really wish somebody would create X because that would be awesome right now. I haven't, I haven't run into that. I have everything right. I think I want. And I haven't seen, and like you say, I haven't seen anyone come out with something that makes me go, oh, wow, I'd never thought about that, but that's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah, um, uh, you know, it might be, I can picture certain personality-driven applications. For example, if, if uh you know, uh, Robert Kirkman wants to, you know, live live blog or live tweet or live uh, uh, talk about a Walking Dead episode while it's ha happening. But again, he already can do that. And if he's going to, it's going to be on Twitter, not on some specific app just for the Walking Dead. And I did try that Walking Dead app that allowed you to kind of watch along. And, and it was really cool is that you could start it when you started, even if you're watching on a DVR. So you didn't have to watch live. And it, and it was synced up so that, you you know, you could see information that supplemented the episode but it just didn't didn't feel like anything i had to do again it was like all right that was kind of neat and it sort of yeah. worked it didn't really add that mu enough to my viewing pleasure and and you know what we tried this at tech tv way back in 2004 with something called gold pocket where you would go on your your computer uh probably a laptop or a desktop and you would watch along with the live show and answer questions and try to get on a leaderboard. And it was supposed to be this interactive thing. And a few people did it, but it was never a roaring success. And I don't think any okay. of those things have been a roaring success. So what we saw from Bright Cove, did you get the, the impression that as much effort as Bright Cove has put into this functionality and this app, uh, doesn't it seem to, it seems to me like, um, all of this will just suddenly be overshadowed the moment Apple does their Apple TV announcement and shows 
the, the the first the the first everything. Like I feel bad because this is all really good work that they're putting into it, and I feel like it's going to be totally overshadowed when Apple announces it. Because even if they announce the exact same thing, it'll be different because Apple's announcing it and they well, put the right amount of polish on it. Yeah, there is that. But I I, I think Bright Cove is doing something really cool here. Uh, and, and the fact of the matter is there needs to be a better way to make HTML5 apps to take more advantage of AirPlay. And, and if nothing else, this will allow a lot more people to try it and maybe mm-hmm. finally come up with that one thing that makes us go, wow. So I'm all for that. I, I, I'm positive on the Brightcove platform here. Uh, on the other hand, I totally agree with what you say, which is when Apple comes out with something, it's going to overshadow all of this stuff. A, because of the last thing you said, it's Apple and people just kind of lose their freaking minds when Apple sneezes. But also <laughs> the fact that uh, what Pete, what I was mentioning about what Pete Rojas said would be much more of a game changer if they're like, oh, yeah, you don't need a cable box anymore. You just buy the new Apple TV and then everything is, is you know, consolidated. And it would be Apple doing to video what they did to music, which is going to the, the problem with digital distribution and trying to solve it. Yeah, I'll tell you what, if if essentially, like Apple will ostensibly be selling an Apple TV, but essentially if they had uh, partnership deals and essentially they were selling a, a complete fundamental revision of the way you interact with TV where you never need to know what channel things are on again, then uh, that would be, I would go out and buy one of these TVs with all this integrated. And I'm somebody who has said repeatedly, I, I want my TVs to be as dumb as possible. But if they can promise me that I will never have to experience TV the old way again, I don't have to know what channel anything's on. I just have a concierge that uh, that suggests awesome stuff and brings me content I love uh, automatically. With, that, with me being as dumb as possible, I will so buy one of these things. And... You'll be able to see swear words live on television. That's our next big story. <laughs> Stop everything. It's another big story. Uh, the Supreme Court ducked the issue of whether fining television stations for indecent broadcast violates the First Amendment. In a Thursday ruling, the High Court found that the FCC had failed to give Fox and ABC adequate notice that their broadcast would be regarded as indecent under its policies. Uh, this is a, uh, a, an episode of NYPD Blue that featured a woman's bear behind and then speeches at award shows that are famous now uh, where Nicole Richie uh, exclaimed a swear word. Uh, you know, So uh, these, these are the sorts of things where the Supreme Court likes to rule very narrowly and not say, we're not saying anything about whether it's okay for the FCC to regulate swear words or not. We're just going to say... You didn't tell them far enough in advance that they should have known that this was a problem, so you don't get to find them this time. Yeah, so specifically, they they refused to rule on the constitutionality of whether or not the FCC has the right to say what you can and can't say on the air. Specifically, they ruled on the fairness of, of how vague they are about their rules. They, they, they're, they're like, we're not saying you can or can't tell people what that's to say, but we are saying that you can't be so vague about what those things are. And then arbitrarily like, okay, well, this is a naked person on television, but it's Schindler's List and I really like Schindler's List. So that's okay. Uh, Okay. This is some curse words on television, but this is Saving Private Ryan. And I, I personally really like Saving Private Ryan. So that's okay. Oh, but this is cursing on an award show. And even though off the air, I probably talked like this and most Americans do, um, it just feels dirty to me, so I'm going to slap you with a fine for a million dollars. That's what they ruled on, and that's that's and that is bogus, legitimately. But the most interesting thing to me was the quote from uh, Justice Alito, who said, uh, "Broadcast TV is living on borrowed time. It's not going to be long before it goes the way of vinyl records and eight-track tapes. Why not let this die a natural death? Or why do you want us to intervene?" And um, I thought that was really interesting because, on one hand, I think he's right. And that it's like the, the relevance of this kind of decision is diminishing by the minute. But on the other hand, we're seeing the FCC trying its damnedest to get its fingers into other mediums as well. And it makes me very – it's very important to me that we get a decision on this. Is it constitutional for the FCC to be the moral police deciding what we should and should not uh, be here, you know, hearing. I mean, you know, you know my position, Tom. If if Fox wants to broadcast hardcore pornography 24 hours a day, let them do it, and then figure out what that does to their market share. Let let the people 
vote with their feet and vote with their dollars uh, to to punish them directly. We don't need this intermediary force that vaguely you know, all of cable is not regulated by the FCC. And you've got all uh, Comedy Central makes the calculated the t- decision that we're going to allow South Park to say the S word. 215 times in one episode because we think in general this is what the people want and we think we will get more advertisers as a result of it and the gamble paid off and that's why south park is a hit and nobody died and if you didn't like it you could change the channel I, but uh oh go ahead i uh, I, I just want to say that uh the the issue here isn't as easy as alito made it seem uh, if if broadcast tv were doomed uh, and and this and, and the basis for the FCC regulation is that there were only three or four channels, and so it was it was harder to get away from indecency. There wasn't as, as much of a market, and, and the broadcasts were happening on public land, so to speak. Uh, the airwaves are a public resource that is administered by the FCC, and the FCC said as part of our our job, like a, like a ranger in a park can tell you not to litter. The FCC can mm-hmm. come in and tell you how to behave on the public land. Uh, and that doesn't apply to cable. That doesn't apply to the Internet. However, there is precedent in regulating broadcasts over airwaves that could apply to broadcasting the Internet over spectrum, over airwaves. And I think it's, it's a little too simplistic when Justice Alito says, well, broadcast TV is going to go away. I think he's right. I think broadcast TV does eventually go away. I think it's going to be a long time, but I, th- I think it will. I do think, though, that you need to rule on the FCC's limits and obligations regarding administering spectrum and that's what this is based on. So when you go back deep enough, it's like, well, the, here, here you're saying something that applies to wireless Internet, possibly. It may not, but it's important to consider. Well, well, here, here's the problem is that broadcast t- television may lose complete relevance, but the FCC will not go away. And when the, FC does not, the FCC does not go away, but broadcast television ceases to be anything important, the FCC will look for other domains to inject itself into. That is the very nature of bureaucracies. And I'm not saying that's good or bad, but these people have jobs at the FCC and they perceive that their job is to, you know, keep things decent. And we don't, there's no cause for a charter on the federal level of decency police. We don't need it. And it's important that we get a decision from the the Supreme Court on whether or not this is constitutional, because I don't think it is. Well, it's but here's the thing. Justice uh, Ginsburg did join the decision and it was a unanimous decision. But in her concurrence, she said that the Supreme Court should overturn the Pacifica decision. 1978 Pacifica decision is known as the seven deadly words uh, decision. No other jo- justices joined her because they're just like, you know what? Let, they followed a very wise ju- judicial principle, which is if you don't need to rule on it, don't. Uh, Ginsburg right. was being a little more activist in this situ- in her concurrence. But I do think that maybe this isn't the right test case, but I, I do agree with you that at some point you do need to say, okay, in the current landscape, when there is so much competition, when it's not 1978 anymore, uh, and, you, and you've got a whole different situation... Does the FCC have the portfolio to rule on this sort of thing anymore? Yeah, it's just a bummer because I just don't see the FCC going away. Uh, what's what's the Thomas Jefferson quote? It's the natural tendency for government to grow and liberty to yield. I mean, that's I know that's 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 crazy. Well, you're you're being all high minded about the FCC's existence here, and I, I, I know. you know we could but, have but, a whole but, separate show about that. Sure, uh, sure, but, sure. But, but let's but, let's but, let's back off of the broad premise for a minute about whether regulatory agencies should exist or not, and and maybe say like it, we have a public limited resource there's going to be have to be some rules about how that resource is divvied up and used and then does indecency anymore uh now that conditions have changed especially need to be one of those considerations and i, and I think yeah, the answer is no and I, right and i agree i agree and and i'm i'm keep in mind i'm not speaking to the fcc's uh uh you know uh, proper role as far as regulating radio spectrum or anything i'm speaking specifically to to the bizarre notion that they should be in charge of 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 any level of the content of what is done with that that's what i that's what i fundamentally disagree with all right let's move into the slipstream just kind of slip into it with me swimming Amazon, we've talked about their uh, their television projects, and they've now approved four 
TV projects for the development uh, slate. Three comedies and one children's project were selected. Doomsday is a mockumentary about the supposed end of the world. Uh, the Hundred Deaths of Mort Grimley is a, an animation comedy where the char- title character must cause the suicides, cause the suicides of a hundred different people in order to save himself from a minion of hell. Uh, and there's a, <laughs> there's a couple more here. The, these sounds like really cool stuff. Yeah, they also sound like adventurous ideas that you might not see in uh, even in, in cable television. Yeah, now these are development. That means the projects are actively being worked on. It doesn't mean they've been approved to be shot yet. Uh, but these are, these are four that they've said, okay, let's, let's actually fund these and, and see if it's worth making them. Yeah, well, I hope, uh, I hope all of this works out. 17, you, 17% of HBO users consider switching to Netflix, according to a report released last Tuesday by Dallas-based research firm Parks Associates. This I, uh, makes no sense to me. This, this is like saying 17% of bicycle riders are considering a switch to cigarettes. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't understand this at I think all. it's a little closer than that, but I know what you're talking about. It's sort of like, well, you don't have to switch. You can have both. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, they serve different markets. I don't understand. I, I think what is interesting, though, is to say, okay, given that how ridiculous that question is, 17% of people surveyed said, yeah, I'd give up HBO and just go with Netflix. So it's it's not switching. It's basically saying if I if I'm considering just relying on Netflix for my movies and not bothering with HBO anymore because it's too expensive and yeah the shows are great but they're not that important to me. I get out my entertainment needs satisfied by Netflix. When you look at it that way that is interesting. Well, I, yeah, but it's also if if I think about it that way then I'm shocked that the number is so small because the number isn't 17% of people are are going to or say they want to uh, considering? Why wouldn't 100% of them consider it? So you're telling me that 83% of HBO will not, uh, HBO subscribers won't even listen to the idea? Like you're at the dinner table and you're like, hey, have you thought about switching to no. Netflix? La, 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 not considering it. That's my wife, by the way. <laughs> hey, what if we just okay, jumped so yeah. HBO and watched only Netflix? Uh, where are we going to get True Blood and Game of Thrones, mister? No, I don't think we're considering that. Yes. Okay. So uh, I'm amazed that 83 percent of HBO subscribers are so are so in love with this service that they won't even consider Netflix. I think we should clarify too. It's just uh, pre. I said HBO because that's the title on paid content, but it is all premium cable subscribers like Showtime, HBO Stars, all of them. Uh, they surveyed those people and said, "Hey, would you consider just dip, dumping that?" And good news for those networks is most of the people said no. No, I, I, I yeah. would not. I would not do that. You're a crazy man. I'm going to get Netflix and. Still pay for my premium content. <laughs> Love Film uh, is bringing Fox UK. Love Film is a you know is a European uh, Netflix like provider. Uh, Fox UK deal bringing more TV shows uh, and movie exclusives in 2013. So it's good news. We'd like to just report on this stuff as it comes. Uh, do, do you think that Love Film is cool with just being called the uh, the no? The UK I, I think Netflix. they're horribly <laughs> insulted. But I, we know, most of our audience is Americans. So I can't figure out any better way. To describe it, where they don't go. Oh, okay. I get it. <laughs> why don't they? Why don't they just add it as a tagline? I want. I want somebody to Photoshop a uh, love film, the Netflix of the UK. Just put it right underneath. Yeah. Well, Netflix is in the UK now, so they're not happy with that either. Actually. Um, yeah. But Sons of Anarchy early seasons uh, coming to Love Film. Complete sets of Twenty Four and Prison Break also coming. Uh, so this they they keep getting more deals there. That's cool. Hulu Plus uh, has a tweak to their Android app. So that it works better on 7-inch devices, 7-inch tablets, uh, and the higher resolution screens that are out there. And it just generally supports more of the Android uh, devices, most notably the Galaxy S2 family, uh, Galaxy Tab 2, and HTC One S. That's awesome. Says the guy who has never touched an Android device. I've touched an Android device. I'm Android curious. (laughs) Show me on the Android device where you touched it. (laughs) I don't know, the power button, maybe? Yeah. Let's uh let, we got really interesting stuff in tube tops. Let's get let's get on to that. So the Google I.O. developers conference is happening this week, and in advance of that, we're seeing a lot of Google TV related announcements, two in particular. Vizio finally has named their Google TV box, and it's called Am I do I have this right? It's the CoStar Stream Player. The yes, reason it's called CoStar right. is because it can work with your current set-top box 
to pass through video. So you just hook yes. it up to your, your set-top box, uh, and you don't have to do an IR blaster, although it does come with an IR blaster if you, if you want to uh, work with it that way. The Logitech Review does the same thing. As an HDMI how does, attach, how does it attach to the set-top box? HDMI cable. Uh, okay, I think you can so, also do component. But but HDMI, you if there's no IR blaster, can you control things? No, there is an HDMI? IR. There is an IR blaster. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I misspoke and made it sound like you could control it through the HDMI. No, there is an IR blaster that allows you to control your set-top box, so that you can use the direct or uh, you can use the Google TV interface. The the key here that's really not that much different than the Logitech Review, but the price is $99.99, 100 bucks wow. for this, this dealie. And well, how much would you pay for that? Don't answer, because you also get on live as an app. Oh, my gosh. So no, the, wait, uh, you still have to pay for the monthly service on OnLive. Correct. You're not getting a free OnLive subscription, but you will be able to use OnLive. The controller, the, the remote for this thing is fantastic, but it doesn't necessarily work great with OnLive, so you might have to go plunk down for the OnLive controller if you really want to take best advantage. But kind of cool that it's on there. Oh, my gosh. Somebody in the chat room is asking, what is OnLive? Uh, OnLive is an amazing idea for those of you guys who don't know. Because I guess, I don't know, we mentioned it from time to time on this show. But uh, OnLive essentially has cloud computing power, high-end computers that can play all the latest, highest-end video games. And it actually renders all the video and all of the memory and everything on in the cloud and then it just streams you the video you stream back your your control and then it it, it basically you, you get a very little bit of lag but you get a high-end gaming experience uh, for very very cheap with virtually no computing power over at your house it's a really cool idea and this has uh, two hdmr uh, two hdmr ports no uh hdmi ports one in one out so you can do the pass through uh ethernet uh, so you can wire connect it, which you should. It does also have Wi-Fi, which is convenient, but uh, probably you're not going to get as good of a video streaming signal that way. USB port for hard drives. So you can add some some space to it. Uh, you can you can add keyboards in that USB hard drive as well. Uh, and the wireless is 802.11n. It's supposed to be available for pre-order in July. So how how do you suppose? Because uh, I know uh, one of our other stories is that the, the the Sony Google TV box is is coming out in the UK on July sixteenth. Um, but the Sony box is one hundred ninety nine dollars. This guy's coming in at ninety nine dollars. How do you suppose they pulled that off? I uh, well yeah. Let's talk about the Sony one then. Let's just just move right into that so we can compare. The Sony has a much better remote. That's not $99 worth of remote, but the remote's pretty crazy. It's uh, way awesome. It's got two sides. On the one side, it's essentially like a laptop-style mouse pad and, uh, and just a few buttons. You flip it over, and it's got a full QWERTY keyboard uh, completely on Bluetooth. Uh, it's, it's, I'm, I'm drooling over this remote. And I think it's got more powerful insides. Uh, it's snappily called the NSZGS7. <laughs> oh, Sony, you truly are wizards of naming. Uh, it also <laughs> it just it, rolls off the tongue. You know, it has digital out uh, and opti- you know an optical digital port. Uh, so it's it's got a few. It's got two USB ports. Uh, it does the HDMI pass through just like the uh, like the CoStar does. Um, I and I it's got a Marvel processor in there, but I don't see what the processor is on the CoStar. So I imagine it's the increased amount of ports, the better uh, remote control. And the processor inside is probably a little higher powered. For instance, there's a 3D output from from the Sony. Not that you care, but that does bring up the cost a little bit. Uh, Marvel 1.2 gigahertz chip. But because they're both Google TV, does that mean they have identical interfaces? Or is that the kind of thing like Android where they may have tweaked and made the user interface slightly different between the two? Yeah, uh, the, the interface is definitely uh, skinned on the CoStar because they have their own specific app here. I'm trying to see, does the interface, they, uh, in our review from Engadget that I'm looking at right now, says it's pretty much the same features and functionalities as we've seen in Google TV 3.2 in the past. However, it does include the Sony Entertainment Network uh, and some options for customizing the remote there's also one uh, option they added, the ability to easily change the picture size to compensate for overscan. Uh, so those are all in the Sony thing that are custom. Wait, this is, 
This is amazing to me because there was a time on this kind of gizmo, you could just look at the numbers associated with it, with the memory and the processor speed and know which one's better. But nowadays, when there's so many innovations on user interface and, um, uh, uh, you know, branding experiences matter, uh, you mean I, fragmentation? I couldn't make a decision. What's that? You mean fragmentation? Yeah, sure, it is, but but it's like I couldn't I couldn't decide right now because no, I want to get a Google TV. But but from what I'm seeing from both of these, I can't decide just from looking at the numbers. I'd have to go actually play with each one and see which one I felt better about. Yeah, I think the Sony is definitely an improvement on the Logitech Review, but that's not saying a whole lot. Uh, I use the Logitech Review, and it's it's a little buggy. It works fine. It does what I want, especially since the software updates. But every once in a while, the Netflix app crashes or won't launch. Uh, and there's just weirdness like that. And I think it has to do with the processing power that's built inside. Logitech did a lot to improve it uh, over its life cycle, uh, but they're kind of done with it now. So I don't expect a whole lot of improvements coming. And I, I, it's, I'm going to have to move on if I want to keep using Google TV. So I'm very interested what else we're going to get from Google TV in the future, which that will be revealed at Google I.O. later this week. Belkin is coming out with their own... TV to net streamer box or sling type thing box. <laughs> they're calling it the sling thing. No, the, they're the, not the, calling the, it. The shot of sling. It's uh, called at TV. Set to go on sale next month. But it pulls in content from your set-top box and other media players and streams it out over the internet. Uh, you can stream it directly to an app over Wi-Fi in your house. Now, that's really interesting I, I guess it's a, get you a better connection than having to go out over the internet and back. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I, may, I feel like I'm reading that wrong, uh, but that's the way it says. It allows you, know, you to incorporate Wi-Fi to allow mobile devices to tap in directly. Um, but, but the important thing is that they're charging, what, like 13 bucks for you to, st to stream it to your smartphone anywhere, right? Yeah, you 13 bucks for the app. And that's, you know, so that's actually cheaper than what Sling charges Wait, oh, for their so it's app. not, it's not, uh, I, I read that as a, like a subscription. That's only, uh, that's only, uh, so that's not 13 bucks a month. No, that's it's 13 bucks. 13 bucks. I, I believe that's just 13 bucks for the app. $149 for the box itself. And like Sling, uh, there are issues with HDMI and this sort of behavior. So there's no HDMI port on this Belkin, which you can get a dongle that'll give you an HDMI out on Slingbox. Uh, that isn't available here. So you get Ethernet port, you get uh, a component out, component in, and uh, good old-fashioned RCA jacks. Now, is that... As is well that, as composite. I guess don't that's care just... About a, it, I don't... I don't know why I never noticed that before. I guess HDMI, because as an interface, it has built-in DRM restrictions. They can't plug it in right there. They have to use the uh, the analog loophole. I used to. They, they explained it to me once why they have to do the dongle instead of building it in, and it has to do with licensing of HDMI. Uh, and, and the licensing has to do a lot with the way it manages DRM. Um, so expect a dongle from Belkin is my guess, because they're dealing with exactly the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, finally, LG announces the Universal Smart TV platform. We talked about this on Tech News Today as, uh, a little bit as well. The idea is that LG is partnering up with as many people as possible, which right now includes one other company, and it's not even a TV manufacturer. But they're trying to create a single app platform for smart TVs that would be across competitors so that everybody can differentiate on the kinds of apps they provide and the interface rather than just on the way the apps work. So the apps that you use, uh, the, the developers would be able to create an app for the smart TV platform and would work on a variety of devices. It's, it's yeah, something that I helps thought, developers. Uh, yeah, well, and, and obviously it sounds like they want to put together a, a competitor to, you know, the Google TV interface or the upcoming Apple TV interface because if you don't plan to play ball with either of those, then you ought to have... Instead of going it alone, everybody developing their own thing, then why not work as a team and have your Now, CNET reports option. it's Philips uh, that's doing this. Uh, so Philips and LG com combining, and the platform tools will be available at the end of 2012. So we probably won't see any TVs with this in it until 2013. And then you're going to have to get the other television manufacturers to sign up and join on for it to really make any difference. Do you, do you foresee that happening? And if, if, if they did... 
do you see yourself going, oh, well, now, now they've got, like, crazy cool apps on that thing. I'm going to buy a TV with smart TV app platform. No, I think, I think, I think they, they're, they're seeing a squeeze coming. You see, you see, as far as competitors, you, you've got this yet unrevealed uh, Apple television. You have uh, uh, what Google TV is doing, building its platform with individual set-top boxes. And then you've got a bunch of these guys just going it alone. The Samsung interface is is uh, on my television, which is uh, I think a year and a half old, is kludgy and clunky and slow. And uh, you know, obviously, um, uh, LG, I believe, I forget which one, is advertising very hard. They're they're interactive. Wave your hands and talk to the TV through the remote thing. Um, instead of everyone going it alone, it makes sense to build a brand for that type of interface. So I think they're doing a smart thing here, but I ultimately don't think it'll be successful. I think it'll it'll be um, kludgy and herky-jerky and nobody will identify with the brand and get excited about it. This seems like a, a half-assed branding marketing effort to me. I feel like they'd have to get Samsung on board to make this work, and then it might turn into something cool because it would have critical mass, and developers might start to go, oh, wait a minute, that's a, that's a lot of TVs. But I don't think Samsung is anywhere close to getting on board with this sort of thing because they have an Apple-like mindset in that they want to control everything themselves and they don't want to cooperate with anyone else. Agreed. Totally agreed. Let's move on to Film Fact. So we've talked about this movie uh, before, Old Man, uh, or I'm sorry, Old Man Franks. That's a guy that, I, that <laughs> I, is in my Warcraft guild. Hey, old man Franks. Uh, Robot and Frank, uh, which we've we've shown some clips for before, but there's a full trailer now. Yeah, yeah. Take a look. It takes a little while to warm up, and I, I, I we'll talk about it afterwards. But but it sort of starts off looking like one movie, and then becomes a totally different movie. Can I help you find anything? Where is the librarian? Hey, Frank. Hey there. What'll it be? The usual. I'd be more interested in getting a phone number. <laughs> Call from Madison Well. Maddie, my girl. Hi. Has Hunter been coming around? Dad, you're right in the middle of the road. Look at this place. This is gross. You have a problem. I brought you something. Hi, Frank. You have got to be kidding me. That thing is going to murder me in my sleep. Somebody's going to murder you in your sleep. Frank, you need a project. Today, we're going to start a garden. I'm not gardening. My program's goal is to improve your health. I would rather die eating cheeseburgers than live off steamed cauliflower. This is Jake Finn. He's been filling me in on the plans for the new library. So it's his you must remember the days when this library was the only way to learn about the world. Sounds like the same people who stopped coming here want to take away what's yours. They're going to have this fundraiser party thing on Friday, and all the young hoity-toity couples are going to come. Sounds awful. Yeah. Do you want to come with me? Yes. Cool. There they are. Frank, you're so square, you're practically avant-garde. What the hell did you just say to me? <laughs> <laughs> Look at all the jewels. These people are loaded. You know what stealing is? I don't have any thoughts on that. I know exactly who the first mark is going to be. Okay, let's see what you can do. According to your file, you were first arrested for possessing stolen goods. I specialized in jewelry. That was your best time yet. I'm getting the hang of it. We're gonna clean up. I'm glad to see you so enthusiastic. I haven't felt this good in years. Hello? Frank, it's me. What's going on in there? Frank Weld is a suspect in a multi-million dollar robbery up the road. What? I'm kind of in a bit of trouble. Of course you are. We gotta get rid of all the evidence. Frank, my memory can be used against you. Don't you touch that robot, Frank! Get in. Frank! That was a buddy comedy. It's time to grow. Thank you, Frank. It's time for your enema. I've led a very uh, colorful life. Wow, talk about giving away the whole movie in a trailer. What do you need? Him? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> yes, that's. I guess we don't know how the how it ends, but. Uh, yeah, well, and, and I, I'm number one, I'm very surprised that they gave away so much of the movie in there and that they spent so much time, they spent half the trailer establishing it as this this quirky, crotchety old man who you're like, oh, I get it, he's going to hate this robot and then come to dig it and, and then and maybe get this girl at the same time. And then randomly, he's a jewel thief. And um, I, I actually, I, I, I'm more mixed up on whether or not 
I, I, I'm intrigued, but I'm not optimistic now. It's very weird. I, I still want to see it. I think it's a great story. I, I do wonder why they gave me so much of the story, but that, that doesn't dissuade me, actually. I, I, I want to see how it turns out, because they didn't tell me. Does he get caught? Does he get away with it? Do he and the robot go on the run and set it up for a sequel? I don't know. Uh, yeah. I, it looks great. I, I still, I guess, I'm still excited about it. I, I, I guess I'm just bummed that I know... I suspect it would have been an interesting twist to suddenly see this jewel thief element come into it. And uh, it, it's sort of like uh, District 9 never let on that it turned into a horror movie or an action movie yeah. uh, in any of the trailers. They only told you the setup, and you were ready to see a mockumentary in a science fiction universe, and that's what made it so amazing when those plot twists came in. This one, I feel like they, they're giving me the goods too early, and there won't be magic when those elements come in. But it's a romantic comedy, and that's what you do with romantic comedies, is you give away the oh. whole plot. And it is sort of a robot, rom- it's a robotic co- comedy. It's Rome, a robo Roman no bot comedy. <laughs> Some hot man on robot. Uh, and Sue, well, don't forget Susan Sarandon. Who looks fantastic. Yeah. She really does. She's been working out. Uh, yeah. Space Command is a project by Mark Scott Zickry. If that name rings a bell, he's been a writer on pretty much every science fiction television show you've ever loved. Uh, Star Trek, Babylon 5. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. Space Command is his Kickstarter project to create a really good, hard sci-fi series in the tradition of those kinds of shows. And we don't see those as much anymore. Uh, and he's just started the Space Cadet program, in which you can sign up to be part of a real-life Space Command and join a weekly conference call with Zikri and get a bunch of other perks. Uh, I, I had... Maybe I think I'd heard about this kicking around, but it wasn't until I saw this story about Space Command, Space Cadet program that I really started looking into it. The The Kickstarter page is freaking manic. There's like 100 million videos, uh, and, and there's all kinds of crazy uh, pledge limits of like $15,000 to get a space helmet. Uh, it, it, it's, it's insane, but it's insanely cool at the same time. Yeah, I'm glad to have you kind of explain what the hell I'm looking at, because I'm not going to lie. I I clicked on it, and I couldn't make heads or tails of what the project was, what was expected of me, or what I could hope that it would achieve. Uh, But it certainly was loud, and it certainly seemed excited about something. (laughs) And so, if if it means more good sci-fi than good, question mark? I mean... (laughs) Doug Drexler, Mark Zickery, and Neil Johnson are the ones behind it, but they have uh, they have uh, plugs from people like Neil Gaiman and Amber Benson uh, and uh, Guillermo del Toro. Uh, so th- there's a lot of people who, who are showing the love for this. They probably just need a little web design tweak. Uh, I'm not saying I could do any better than them, uh, but it looks like a crazy cool idea, and I hope that it gets its funding. It's right now... Uh, well over its goal. So it, it's got its funding to get started, no problem. People are, are really into it. And if you pledge $5, you get a Space Command ID card, uh, your name and rank on the website, and access to the secret forum. $8 uh, gets you a, uh, uh, an HD Blu-ray edition of Space Command when it comes out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, on up to being part of, you, you get you know lieutenant ranks, ranks, commander, captain ranks, et cetera, et cetera. Just perfect for Star Trek, Babylon 5, et cetera, fans. You know, and it's interesting because it takes the um, – nobody's more into how the sausage is made than hardcore – you know, the the original paradigm is the the Star Trek fans, right? They love to break down who was in which and what built each item and how it's configured. Uh, And so this sort of takes that enthusiasm and turns it into a why not be in on the inside – from the very beginning, why why wait until after the product is out? You fall in love with it to find out how it's made. Why not be part of how it's made right now? I think that's a really interesting twist. Finally, uh, Nielsen has come out with their top five YouTube partner channels, and they are not surprising. Uh, <laughs> I was about to ask you if you were surprised by a single one of them. Not, I was not. <laughs> not at all. These these you know YouTube started this partner effort, uh, which full disclosure I'm a part of. Sword and Lasers on the Geek and Sundry channel, which YouTube funds. Uh, but 
these these are not the channels that YouTube is funding for the most part. Number one is Vivo, which is a big partnership with YouTube. I guess there is funding going on there, but it's not one of these small channels that they funded. Uh, Warner Music Group is number two. So it's video, music videos up on the top. Machinima, number three, which is one of these partner channels, but it also long pre-existed YouTube's effort for partner channels. So, so they Machinima are- was always the surprise entry in that top five, where it's just like you, you just don't realize how many people love to watch other people play games or watch game trailers or, or yeah. game-related video. And then full screen and maker uh, round out the top five. All right. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's good. All right. Let's check in on the uh, summer movie draft, shall we? Well, this past week, we saw three movies. Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, 16 million. Brave, 66 million. And uh, Seeking a Friend at the End of the World. Uh, it looks like a great movie, but then I didn't see it either. Three million. Three million, which means, which means million. that... Rounds uh, to four. That I- Here's the amazing part, Tom. It means that at $2, I still overpaid for Seeking a Friend for the End of the World. Oh, no, really? Yeah, you're right. You kind of did. It's the least amount of gross per dollar. No, second least to Abraham Lincoln. Okay. Uh, it'll amazing. get better, though, because a few more... No, it won't. It won't get better. Yeah. <laughs> it's over for you, Brushwood. I'm sorry. Uh, and I'll that's tell your you last movie, over. right? Uh, well, yeah, that that is my last movie, and I'll I'll tell you what. At this point, you know, obviously, there's no chance of me winning. I'm thrilled. I made it past five hundred million dollars. That's at least I I scooted into respectable territory. Uh, and most importantly, I won my side stake bet with Justin Robert Young in that my four movies in May did make more than three hundred and fifty seven million dollars. So I got a fat stake coming to my face. June 29th, premiering this week, for those of you who missed that segment, which runs when we're not doing a draft, uh, is Ted, Justin Robert Young's movie. Yeah, which, which is not supposed to be. Keep in mind, he paid for and expected to have G.I. Joe, and Ted is just a, a substitute because they moved G.I. Joe later on. So, uh, and to be honest, Justin I'm, is justifiably frustrated because G.I. Joe would have made a crap ton more money than Ted. And, and if slash win Justin Robert Young loses, he could justifiably point and say that substitution, that movement of G.I. Joe is what cost him the game. And uh, but that's, that's how the game plays. Yeah. Sorry, bro. Uh, Sixty five million dollar budget for Ted. Now, this is about the Ted talks and how they're put together. And no, no, no. no. it's, it's about, that, it's, about right. a, it's about a stoner teddy bear. Oh, it's that it's the Muppet movie, but never going the Muppet route. It's just the the guy who lives with the teddy bear who t- yeah, watches and talks. Ex- exactly. <laughs> oh, I didn't even think about that. It does borrow or or the share op- elements of the Muppet movie. The opening premise of the Muppet movie, exactly. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about what we're watching. <laughs> Watching. I watched the Sword and Laser interview with George R. R. Martin over and over and over. How was it? Was it amazing? <laughs> it was really good. He's he's a great guy. Uh, once he kind of caught on that we were we were nerdy, uh, he was he was into it. He uh, the the pinnacle of of the interview is when Veronica got him to admit that he was a little upset at the Avengers because they didn't have Ant Man, and so he understands why people get upset when things change when they're adapted for movie and TV. <laughs> wait, he wait, wait, okay. What's funny is though, uh, if anyone could get away with being upset uh, at the changes, it's George R. R. Martin because he's been so good and so true to, uh, to to the books. I mean, every change that there's been on the show has been supremely minor and has overall kept, enhanced the overall story. Yeah, and, and you know, we talked about how they are hewing so close and we were asking him whether it was cool to be able to tell some stories that you didn't get to tell in the book, like the story about uh, the the woman that Rob marries, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't want to get too spoilery, but yeah, it was it was very cool. Uh, also watched the newsroom on HBO, which Wait, came. Oh, is that the new one with the with the 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 it's news the Aaron, that has a meltdown? Yeah, it's Aaron Sorkin written, uh, and you can tell. And I have to say, for the first twenty minutes, I felt like it was pandering. I felt like it was a little bit like, you know, news used to be perfect, and now it's not anymore. And I was like, news was never perfect. It's worse than it's ever been, but it was never perfect. And the thing is, 
I gave it enough time to play that out, and it turns out that the characters come around to say, no, news never has been perfect, but it can be better, and we're going to make it better. And it takes place at the time of the Deepwater Horizon spill, and that's the first story that they jump on. And there's a lot of personal stories to keep it interesting. You've got a mysterious uh, past romance between the new executive producer and the host, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, what started as preachy, in my opinion, ended up being really exciting when they started showing the newsroom going into action to cover the story, get people on the phone, get people to admit things. Uh, it was really exciting to watch. Now, every time I've seen a promo for this, it just looked like Network the series. Like you saw Network from the 1970s, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. And I, I, and I felt that flavor and was worried that it was just not going to be interesting. But when they got into the newsroom action, I'm like, OK, I'm liking this now. Uh, so right. hopefully it'll be more like that in future episodes and less about the like, you know, we need to bring back the spirit of Edward R. Murrow. Uh, right. And what, what saved me on that, that token was they talked at, at one point, one of the characters said, look, Edward R. Murrow did have an opinion about okay, McCarthyism. I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that because Cronkite, that's the first thing I thought of. Cronkite did have an opinion about Vietnam and those were the watershed moments, but they, they, they used it carefully. They used it responsibly. Uh, so I, I'm into it. What do you, what have you been watching? Not one thing this entire week long, Tom. Let me restate that. I have not seen one lick of video of any variety for a full week. How crazy is that? I thought you saw Brave. No, my family went and saw it. Oh. And Bonnie, Bonnie called and says, and like Bonnie was way disappointed. She says, why can Disney not have a single movie with a female lead that's not about who she dates? Like, every single movie that has a female as a lead character is, oh, I know you want blank, but you can't be with blank because they are a different uh, race slash gender slash ethnicity slash social structure slash species. But that, that's, that's called a love story. I mean, what she's saying I is mean, I want someone to do a better love story, but that's basically yeah, the trope that's of a not, love story. That's not what she wants. She doesn't want a love story. She wants she wants a female main character in a Disney animated movie to not be in a love story. About, yeah, exactly. Yeah. All and right, it's like, that's fair. What a missed opportunity! With with of if picked if anyone could have done it, it would have been Pixar. And instead, Pixar does. You need to marry this guy that you don't like because of rules and things and reasons. Well, it's an and, accurate uh, representation of medieval society, Brian. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, that's fine. But uh, I, I obviously, they're this, going for a very realistic portrayal of medieval society. <laughs> Well, the, yeah, it's the, that and Game of Thrones, just side by side. Yeah, uh, pretty much neck and neck. So we go. I look forward to seeing Brave. The, the kids enjoyed it for what that's worth. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you, this this is not a movie, and this is uh, I have no other place to tell people about this though. Uh, I, I finally started reading the comic book uh, Lock and Key, written by Joe Hill, Stephen King's son, and it is phenomenal. I ended up, uh, John gave me the first trade and, uh, after reading through it, I ended up gobbling up all the rest. I think I spent like 40 bucks on comiXology. Uh, it's amazing. If you dig, it's, it's, it's got very Stephen King S themes. It's got inanimate objects, this house that seems to call to people. It's got, um, uh, the circular nature of things, things that the parents did, uh, rebubbling up with the, with the children, uh, the supernatural, there's, there's questions and questions. And every time you get an answer to one question, you get two more interesting questions, really loving lock and key. You, I'm going to, I'm going to gift you the whole set. So you'll read it. Tom. All right. I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night. Let's check the feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio, yeah. See, what I did there is I made a Phil Oaks joke, knowing that no one was going to get a Phil Oaks joke, and I went right into the... That's, you did good. Uh, that's, I, I, I don't even know who Phil Oaks is, so I can't even appreciate the Billy difficulty Bragg of that Billy Bragg wrote a song, I Dreamed I Saw Phil Oaks last night. Uh, Rob I... writes in, hey, Brushwood, I'm a 49-year-old single, childless, heterosexual male hooked on Adventure Time with Finn and Jake. Thanks a lot, Spikehead. Woo! That's one. The rest of the world left to go. Uh, Michael says, hey, Tom and Brian, would you, I'd like to walk you through a hypothetical scenario for me. What would happen... If we threw a switch and all video DRM disappeared, or all DRM for that matter, what would the business impact be? What devices or inventions uh, are now possible? What would the world look like? I realize that this won't cure cancer, but I'd be curious to know how the world would look different to you guys. Thankfully, science can answer this question. 
uh, because we did get rid of DRM on music. And as we know, the music industry has collapsed because of piracy. There are no musicians <laughs> making music anymore. Uh, the, the, the streets are bereft of song. And uh, society is now the poorer culturally because of it. It's what's funny is is I was gonna say uh, uh, I was gonna say amazingly something fundamentally different will happen in a future with no DRM. Pirates will choose to illegally copy music and hand it around, and honest people will choose to pay for it. In other words, it will look exactly the way it looks right now. I think what Michael's getting at, though, to, to seriously answer his question is. Think of all the devices that we could have uh, that would be popular, because we actually kind of already have a lot of these, if they didn't have to worry about HDMI, DHCP protocol. If they didn't have to say, oh, well, we could sling this, this, uh, this uh, video all, to all your devices and all around the house and all around the world on the Internet and store it in the cloud if we didn't have to worry about the license restrictions that, you know, and the fact that we have to re- support multiple DRM protocols. I think what you'd see is the ability to watch anything you want wherever you want and there would be pressure on the studios and the video providers to make things available faster and differentiate their products. I think the you know one of the things that might change the most would be movies. I think we would see movies suddenly go beyond just 3D as a differentiator. They would come up with big reasons why you have to go to the theater to watch something if they had the pressure to release videos that you watched on your tiny screens later. Well, imagine, okay, think about movies. Uh, Think about movies like Battleship, something that cost, I'm going to make up all these these numbers, and they're not fair, and I apologize. But let's say something like Battleship cost uh, $200 million to make, and let's say $100 million of it is marketing. What if, what if, because you were forced to innovate, you had to spend $100 million not on promotions with Subway to, to slap your stuff on every freaking cup that you get there, but instead they had to spend $100 million on creating a truly compelling ARG, alternate reality game, where you had an individualized, where you had a staff of people who were there to answer emails about this fictitious conflict that's coming, and you had an actual role, and every person who went to go see the movie had some kind of personalized experience backstory going into it, where they felt an ownership and a level of immersion a billion times more interesting than 3D uh, and and they could have a truly novel experience, something that couldn't be pirated. Like, yeah, you could see the movie, but what's the point of seeing the movie if you didn't spend the last six months, uh, you know, exchanging important emails, solving puzzles, and winning prizes leading up to it? There's a million things that could be that we never find out because it's easier to lock down the current pipe of money instead of uh, letting people, you know, letting the marketplace of ideas go a little bit nutty. I think another good example is Atmos that we talked about with Scott Wilkinson last week, which, by the way, we're going to have Scott on the show again next next week uh atmos is something you can't replicate easily in your house in fact you can't replicate in your house right now uh and so that's a reason to go to a theater because you're going to get an experience that you just can't have a theater is a huge building with a much bigger budget than us so there are things it can do that we can't and they they just need to do those things that's all just do them yeah just do things people Gosh. I know, it's easier said than done. Uh, D-Dog wrote, uh, Derek Chen, in response to your discussion regarding the Xbox, there's definitely a direction Microsoft is moving with the brand that I think became especially clear during E3. Given the huge success of the Xbox, Microsoft seems to be rebranding their suite of entertainment offerings under the Xbox name. This year, whether it be on Windows 8, mobile, or gaming console, Microsoft will likely attach the Xbox name to their games, music, and video service, For example, Xbox Games, Xbox Music, Xbox Video, Xbox Smart Glass. Which, if you think about it, would be along the lines of what we see with Google Play and Apple's iTunes slash App Store. I think this is a very smart idea. And it it points out what is so smart about the the Xbox name as a brand. Because, number one, we've had, what, about a decade of building up positive associations with Xbox. We think about it when we think of high-end games and we think of uh, a lot of popular titles. Uh, but it also means, you know, if you think of it in terms of Xbox, X means the blank. It's it's whatever you want to fill it in with, you know. And it's uh, uh, the idea of the Xbox being the box that can do whatever you need in your living room. I think uh, I think it's smart for them to start branding it that way. Now, and what we hope is that the only way this backfires on them is we if we see shovelware 
being put into them and we have bad user experiences. But it's obvious with Microsoft's experience, I think for the most part, they, they learned a lot and they innovated a lot in small ways with uh, their experiments with Zune. And if they could take those lessons and give us, again, I'd hate to say it, but like an Apple-like quality where it's very consistent, very well managed, then Xbox could create an ecosystem that uh, is, is stronger than Apple when it comes to consumer media. All right, that's it for this episode of Frame Rate. Don't forget, folks, if you do watch live, uh, we will be recording on Monday next week at our new time, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. And uh, you, that means you'll get the show earlier than you would normally get in your podcast feed as well. You can email us, framerate at twit.tv. Find us on the web, twit.tv slash fr. Last word to you, Brian Brushwood. I love you. 